So dear friends and colleagues, welcome to yet a, another Belgrade Legal Theory Group event. Um, we're continuing with the topics related to social ontology, uh, and this time with Professor Corrado Roversi, who is going to talk on the social ontological critique of legal positivism. Um, Professor Roversi teaches philosophy of law at the University of Bologna and holds a PhD in analytic philosophy and general theory of law. He focuses his research on legal ontology and the phenomenology of institutional concepts, as well as cognitive sciences and legal epistemology. Um, with this regard, you may find some of his publica publications, such as, uh, for example, Conceptualizing Institutions, or on the artifactual and natural character of legal institutions, but also cognitive science and the nature of law and so on. Um, as you all know, the lecture lasts uh, 30 minutes, after which we'll have a 30 minute discussion. So without further ado, dear professor, thank you for being with us and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm starting to sh trying to share my screen, but I, I don't know. I, I'll make you a presenter just to see if I see. Uh, ta, 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 or maybe Boyan, if he could access, because I don't have. Uh, should be able to do. But he should be able to to share it. I see the sign here. Yep. Uh, I'm trying to to do it, but don't know why it's not working. So, anyway, so let's let's, you, see manage. let's see if I manage. No. But you can sh you can send it to one of us, and then we can try to share the screen, and then you can tell us yeah. to move the the slides if you want. Okay, fine. So yeah, we can do it like that. Uh, just send it to me, Corrado, and I'll I'll forward it to Sab. Thank you. Sorry for this. Oh, no, it's fine. <laughs> uh, it's here. There is usually an option for a host to make you a presenter, but somehow I, I'm not seeing that option now. So oh, he already is a presenter. It's, it's so just uh -huh. okay. It should be assign all privileges. Okay. Yeah, no, we'll we'll manage. Just to... here. Sent. Yep. Sent now, yes. Did you receive it? I'm trying to. Because in my Mac, it says uh, I need to give uh, access. Ah, uh, okay. So yeah, in privacy settings, and I, I'm trying to do it, but don't know yeah, why. you have to go to system settings and then to yeah. screen record, and she then is. now, now, okay, fine. Yeah, then within screen record, then you have to put it on like the, and then in that moment you would be able to to share your screen. Exactly, exactly. So, uh, however. Um, what it says is that I need to abandon the meeting at this point to to make it work. So can you can you wait two minutes for me? Yeah, of course. You can do that definitely. I'll be back in two minutes. Sure. Sava, um, I've sent you now the presentation, Corrado's presentation. Uh -huh, in case it doesn't work. In case okay. It doesn't work. Just got to download it a sec. Let me see his file. No, it's a PowerPoint. That's good. Ah, okay. Now I can forward it. So, yeah, it's always like this when somebody doesn't use WebEx or he uses it for the first time. You always need to get give these. But it's good. We have more guests. We waited a couple of minutes so we can start. And I'm pre I'm getting pretty good with this post production with the editing of videos, so I can cut out stuff as much as I like. 
Yeah, you have it now in your mail, so... I'll check. Mm. Yeah, okay, I got it. We have now Corrado both options at our disposal. Okay. Now, I don't know why, but it's difficult for me. So, okay, so go ahead with your sharing. Sala. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's fine. Just a second. So it's Do you see it? Yes, we can. See yes, okay. perfectly. I'll, yeah, I'll change the slides as you keep on going. So good. So it's an animated presentation. So there will be a little bit <laughs> to. Uh, okay, so I, I will um, I will ask you to go forward um, mm -hmm. also for the animations. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much for um, um, uh, having me in this uh, seminar. It's it's a great pleasure to have all, to, to to have the opportunity to share my thoughts with you and to discuss uh, my ideas. Thank you to. For, for inviting me. So um, today I, I'm, I'm going to present what I, I call a social ontological argument against legal positivism. And so what I will do basically is to use some notions drawn from contemporary social ontology to cast some doubts on um, yeah, a quite traditional legal philosophical conception uh, conceived in a specific way. So, um, conceived as, and this will be crucial for my argument, as a theory for the identification of law, mm -hmm. and particularly as a theory about how to state what a legal institution is. And this view is legal positivism, or what I call normativistic legal positivism. So, you can go ahead. Next slide. Here it is. So normativistic legal positivism states that uh, yeah, law is made up of norms and the existence and content of these norms depend on a rule following practice on the part of officials and particularly typically on their declarative speech acts. This is a view that I call normativistic uh, which is not normative legal positivism, as Ken Ehrenberg rightly pointed out to me. Thank you, Ken, for, for uh, making it possible for me to, to make this clarification. And this is a descriptive so view, not the normative view, which we can attribute to Kelsen and, and Hart. And uh, the consequence of this view about the nature of a legal institution is uh, so please uh, go on. Yes, that a legal institution is made up of rules, and the content of existence of these rules is determined by officials, particularly by their declarative speech acts. Um, so my idea, my thesis, instead will be that what a legal institution is does not depend only on the practices and particularly the declarative speech acts of officials. Um, good. So uh, let's. Okay. This is this is the the important point. So according to normativistic legal positivism, um, the view is that in terms, if framed in terms of criteria of identity of an institution, the the view is that if P one and P two share the same rules and there is a corresponding rule following practice on the part of officials um, then p1 and p2 are the same institution and what i will try to argue instead and next will be that even if p1 and p2 have the same rules and this, there is a corresponding rule following practice 
this is not the case. So P1 and P2 can be different institutions. Next. So um, it is worthwhile to note that there is a strong parallelism between a standard model in social ontology, which is source model, and that shared by normativistic legal positivism. The standard model of social ontology, an institution, a social institution, is basically a set of constitutive rules supported by uh, collective acceptance. In the case of normativistic legal positivism, you have an idea which is close, only that it is two layered. So there is a basic layer, which is that of the institution of legal validity, which is indeed based on the practice and acceptance of uh, officials. Uh, this creates the institution of legal validity on the basis of which uh, you can create other institutions um, by way of formally valid legal rules. Next, by the way, this um, description was very well described by Kenneth Ehrenberg in a, in a very very interesting paper, The Institutionality of Legal Validity, published in Philosophy and Phenomenological Research, um, in, in which he uh, describes this two-layered. Uh, apart from Kenneth Ehrenberg's uh, paper, there is also next, uh, Brian Epstein's um, analysis in his The Ant Trap, uh, in which he built the two-layered structure of Hart's legal system uh, in a way that can be traced to a social ontological model. Good. So my view will be, now that we are able to put constitutive rules into the picture, my view will be that no, even if P1 and P2 have the same constitutive rules and there is a corresponding rule following the practice, P1 and P2 can be different institutions. And to show this, I will use two notions borrowed from um, uh, contemporary social ontology. On the one hand, the notion of background, or to use a source idea, notion, that of deeper network, but I will use background and particularly. And on the other hand, the notion of systematic fallouts. So let me introduce you to these ideas. Uh, so, in a paper of 1969, Hubert Schwitzer, in a wonderful paper that you may know, titled Rules and Practices, Hubert Schwitzer notes that uh, there is at least an element of chess that is not constituted by the rules of chess, namely the fact that chess is a game. And he says clearly that the fact that chess is a game is in no way uh, a rule of the game. What Schwitzer has in mind is that in order for building the game of chess, there must be already in place, let's say, a grammar of game playing. And uh, this grammar pre-exists, let's say, the activity of the creation of rules of chess. And he says at the end of this quotation, it follows that one can bring a new practice into being by setting up rules, or engaging in it, only where the grammar of that behavior according to the rules is already given. So the idea is that there must be something already in place to give meaning to the set of constitutive rules. Now, uh, in uh, um, his um, work of 1995, The Construction of Social Reality, and particularly also in his 2010 work, Making the Social World, um, John Searle captures this idea with the idea of a background. He says that the intentional states making up an institution by way of collective acceptance do not come in isolation. They come embedded into a network of other states and also into a network of capacities, abilities. So, Sir calls this network of in further intentional states, uh, indeed, local network. Um, and in other works, he makes a distinction between local and deep network. 
and he calls this set of abilities and capacities, which are not necessarily propositional, um, no propositional content, the background. I will use the background as a general term. Here, the idea is that an institution cannot exist if there is no background in place. Now, Andrei Marmor, in his work, and thank you, um, so Social Conventions 2009, makes a similar point by distinguishing between deep conventions and surface conventions. And he says that deep conventions typically enable a set of surface conventions to emerge. And surface conventions are only made possible as instantiations of deep conventions. So in all these books, in all these works, uh, you find a similar argument, namely the idea that the content of institutions is not determined only by the institution's rules, but also by further elements, namely, let's say the grammar, the role that this institution is meant to play in, in social, in, in our social life. One could also say the purpose of, the, of it, it's deeper uh, rational, um, and, and these elements are part of uh, the background. Now, let's move to the other notion that I will present, namely the notion of systematic fallouts. In, in a wonderful paper by Hemi Thomason of 2002, um, she argues that not everything in the creation of institutions can be traceable to collective intentionality, because um, um, otherwise, uh, social sciences could not make any kind of genuine discovery. Um, everything would already be present in our intentional states. Um, but there are several phenomena, and she uh, mentions economic cycles, class systems, power structures, that are capable of existing in our social uh, domain, even if no one believes that anything of the kind exists, even if we do not already have the concept of it, this phenomena can exist. Uh, so not everything is created by intentional states and intentional acceptance. In a further work, John Searle accepts uh, Thomason's work, Thomason's point, and he introduces the idea to account for these phenomena that cannot be explained in terms of collective intentionality, the idea of systematic fallouts. And he gives this example from baseball. So in baseball, statistically, left-handed batters do better against right-handed pitchers and, 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 and the other way around. So this is not required by the rules of baseball. It is just something that happens. And these are third person fallout facts from institutional facts. So this is a phenomenon, a fact, but consider another example that is given by Asa Burman in a, a recent book, next slide, please. Uh, her recent book, Non-Ideal Social Ontology, 2023. Here, she mentions the fact that some powers can depend not from how constitutive rules create them. So some powers are not, strictly speaking, deontic powers, but they depend from deontic powers uh, and from a specific way of building a strategy, let's say, around them. So she gives this example. Imagine that the head of a country's central bank declares that interest rates will increase and this is an exercise of the only power, but imagine that he also happens to mention some interesting new startups, including his friend's company. By virtue of his status function as the head of the central bank, and this is an institution dependent property, this person can affect a certain outcome, not by exercising his deontic powers, but still in virtue of his status function. And she labels this idea, this power, which is a sort of causal power that emerges from the institutional framework, but that is not constituted by the rules, 
of the framework, she labels spillover effects of a status function or adiantic power. So all these authors under the label systematic follows argue that there is more in institutional practice uh, than strictly speaking rules and collective acceptance of rules. There are strategies and intended consequences, previously unforeseen effects, indeed fallouts hmm, that are not constituted by collective acceptance of rules. Now, if these uh, notions denote genuine phenomena, here is my argument. My argument is that even if P1 and P2 have the same constitutive rules and there is a corresponding rule following practice, P1 and P2 can be different institutions either because they have different background assumptions or because the systematic fallouts that follow from them are different. So the institutions will be different even if the rules are the same and even if the collective acceptance on the part of, uh, let's say, officials uh, will be the same, okay? So now let me give an example to argue for this. And let's start with the background. Now, suppose that chess is played not simply as a game, but as a way to ascertain the will of gods. So suppose that chess is a ritual practice. This is an example given by Schwitzer himself. Now, what I tried to do is to apply this example to law. Suppose, for example, that having a right uh, under a contract, apart from everything we know about rights of obligations and duties of obligation and so on, apart from that, which, which would remain the same, suppose that this were taken to be a honorable position in the God's eyes. So a kind of ritual contract or a game. We can go forward and suppose that uh, we have the president of the Republic in the Italian legal system with all the rules, the same kind of rules, but we also have the background assumption according to which being the president is means also having the highest honorable position in the God's eyes or again. So that, that was a picture generated by AI. <laughs> or suppose that valid laws were taken to be willed by gods. So suppose that we enact laws normally and according to the normal procedures, and then once they are enacted, the background assumption says, Okay, they have been enacted and this shows that they are willed by God. So this, th there is a, a kind of ritual validity. Now, here we have a situation where the background assumptions change, whereas the rules remain the same. Could chess and ritual chess, contracts and ritual contracts, precedent and ritual precedent, formal validity and ritual validity be the same institution? It seems to me that they would not be the same institution. They would be different institution. Why? They would be a different social institution because they would have a really different social meaning and import. So the idea would be that these deontic statuses could, could entail also honorific statuses in a non entirely conventional way. Uh, so the institution would acquire, apart from its normative function, a kind of signaling function. It would communicate something relevant, what is willed by God. Apart from not being the same social institution, they would also be different legal institutions, it seems to me. Uh, and this is the next part. So they will not be even the same legal institutions because the effects could be different. So for example, judges could not uh, encourage and enforce a typical contract. Um, the president could ask the parliament to reconsider a law and probably the parliament would not pass it again, even if it would have the power to do it. 
the abrogation of virtually valid law would be possible, but would be perhaps performed less and perhaps uh, extensive interpretation um, of, uh, of enacted law would be preferred. There would be a sort of principle of permanence of law. And this would depend on background considerations, not on what officials declaratively enact. This is my point. Now let's move forward with systematic fallouts. With systematic fallouts, my argument is similar. So suppose that chess is played in an abusive way. For example, by players make everything they can to play the white, or that contracts are made to cover the activities of mafia practices, or that uh, precedents are uh, elected, um, basically, but they are chosen among old, passive, and acquiescent persons to avoid supervision, real supervision. Or suppose again that um, laws were not, uh, let, let's say, were enacted. This is the next, the next point. Were enacted only uh, to confirm ex post the government decrees. Something that, by the way is not so unusual. Um, now, my point is that these abusive institutions with different systematic fallouts, different spillover effects, um, um, would not be uh, the same institution. They would be different social institutions and legal institutions. Uh, OK, they could be different social institutions because they would have a completely different social meaning. Basically, they would have a sort of masking rule, a sort of covering function. Probably the group supporting them would be very different. And uh, there would be a, a completely different story, social story around them. And also, probably, they would be different legal institutions um, because, of course, the, the, the idea of uh, constitutional checks and balances would be completely different. Um, separation of powers would, could be undermined. Also, for example, abusive, typically abusive contracts, uh, there would be a sort of reaction on the part of the, of the judiciary. So the, the very idea of, a, of abuse of law perhaps would be completely different. So even the legal context work would be different. So what can we get from this discussion? My idea is that uh, we need a way to conceive legal institutions that complements the legal positivistic one. Because the legal positivistic one focuses only on the institutional level. And this is a monodimensional model for institutional ontology, namely the set of constitutive rules. But we need a three-dimensional model in which we also take into account a meta-institutional level, namely the background assumptions about the social meaning and purpose on one hand, and also the para-institutional level, namely the features the, 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 the activity has with its spillover effects, systematic fallout, the unintended consequences, what indeed happened in the social context, in the specific social context, when the institution is practiced. So I think that we can uh, connect the meta-institutional level to our discussion about background and the para-institutional level uh, with our discussion about systematic fallouts. By the way, and this is the next slide, these levels are metaphysically connected because they have a obvious relation of existential dependence. So the game of chess could not exist if the background practice of playing a game did, did not exist. The strategies of chess and other features of actual chess gameplay could not exist if the game of chess did not exist. So existential dependence. But also perhaps we can argue about stronger metaphysical relations. For example, a relation of grounding between the meta-institutional and the institutional level and the relation of emergence between the institutional level and the para-institutional level. Because 
as you see, strategies of chess, in a sense, in a sense, emerge out of the rule following behavior with further causal properties. And the fact that chess is framed according to these rules and not others is partially explained by the fact that it is a game. So these metaphysical relations seem to hold. Now, conceived in light of this model, the legal positivistic ideal starts from two assumptions that are correct. The first is that you can change only the institutional level by declaration, and this is true, because you cannot change the background by declaration, and you cannot change the systematic fallouts and the strategies in a given social context by declaration. And the second consequence that they draw is that the levels are explanatorily distinct and cannot be reduced to the institutional level. But the consequence that they draw from this is that these two further levels are not law. So they say that perhaps the meta-institutional level has to do with politics, morality, uh, social assumptions, and the para-institutional level has to do with sociology. So they drop. So next, they drop the other two by saying that um, only the institutional level, properly speaking, is makes up the institution. Now, my point is, if these two levels were not law, they would not have an impact on what legal institutions are, but they have a strong impact on the content and very existence of, inst of institutions in a given social setting. Uh, they, they have a strong impact on how the institution develop, and so, they should be considered to be part of uh, law. Now, by the way, uh, I think apart from this general argument, and I'm going to conclude, I think this model can have significant explanatory power. And it can have significant explanatory powers on puzzles that are quite typical for legal positivism. The meta-institutional level, in my view, of course, this is what I'm wondering about, but it seems to me that it can, can give uh, elements about the problem of the foundations of law. So the typical legal positivistic problem, if law is a normative structure, how can it identify itself? Um, how can validity be a legal concept if legal concepts are constituted only by valid legal norms? The problem of foundations of law. Now, perhaps validity is not an institutional concept, but it is a meta-institutional concept. Uh, so the legal system defines the criteria of validity, but what validity means, uh, the import of legal validity uh, can be a meta-institutional concept. So there could be a situation where you presuppose validity, even if there is no actual instantiations of the formal conditions of validity. Of course, this is simply an idea that suggested. Uh, but this is to show that the, the three-dimensional model uh, perhaps could be useful on explanatory grounds. By the way, if this is the case in the debate between Kelsen and Hart, Kelsen could be the one who uh, is right, um, because in this sense, validity must be presupposed. Um, or second element, second problem, the problem of social practice. So the problem of uh, explanation of phenomena that are social phenomena, but that are not strictly speaking phenomena dependent, created by rule following practice or not only, uh, so the abuse of law, causal powers emerging from institutions, even the idea of a nudge created by deontic powers. So for example, the kind of nudge that police officers have only in virtue of their mere, mere presence. So these kinds of causal powers cannot be explained by um, a, a, a 
formalistic view, but these are relevant for the existence of law. And it seems to me that they can be illuminated by the category of a parainstitutional level. So, um, and that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, first of all, for an excellent, interesting and provoking lecture, uh, as well as also for staying within the time frame that was given. Um, now we have a 30 minute time frame for a discussion. Uh, so I uh, call for participants to raise their virtual hands if they have a comment or a question or perhaps write in the chat. I can already see Professor Ehrenberg has raised his hand, so please take the floor. Okay, this is a great stuff. I heard some of it before, but I think it's evolved a lot since then. Um, I guess I should raise, lower my hand here. Um, I just had a couple questions because my inclination is to kind of um, side with what you might consider to be the traditional um, positivist position in some ways. And so I wanna push back in a couple of different places if I can. First place is I, I think that the positivist picture is consistent with your 3D model in the sense that it is comfortable with what you're describing as meta and para institutional, as the meta and the para institutional properties that institutions generate maybe or depend on. <clears throat> I don't think it's that um, there's anything inconsistent in that with what positivism says. I, I would question calling the meta and the para institutional properties themselves institutions, though, um, because we can talk about how institutions have properties that are themselves not institutional in the sense that they were created through an institutional process. So fallouts and background and background requirements for institutions themselves may be necessary for the institution to come into being, or they may be um, unavoidable side effects of the institution's operation. But that doesn't mean that those elements themselves are institutional in the sense that they don't have the properties we associate with institutions directly, such as that they you know, are, um, you know, like artificial systems for altering people's, you know, deontic powers and things like that. Now, it's possible that some of the fallouts can then be taken up and used to alter people's deontic powers, but it might just be that um, that would be then the creation of a distinct institution. So some of the fallouts themselves might give rise to, let's say, the raw materials for new for new institutions, but I don't think it makes sense to say that they are they are automatically either part of the same institution or themselves institutional without having somebody kind of manipulate it in order to make it into something that's institutional, right? Um, um, yeah, um, like one of the things you said is that it makes sense to call them legal because if they are not, you know, if we didn't think of them as law then they, why would they have such a big impact on law? That's one of the things that you said. And, and that struck me as actually emblematic because you know, following Raz and many other people, we can say there's a lot of things that have huge impacts on law and law has a lot of huge impacts on other things that we don't automatically thereby call part of the law, right? I mean, yeah, you know, cops have this kind of extra authority and they have this kind of, um, you know, uh, what should we call it, as you put it, the, um, um, you know, the, the fact that people might act in certain ways around them without them actually having to get the direction. That might be a side effect, certainly, of their, of their institutional status, um, but it's not itself a legal element. You know, it's not an element of the legal system to say that they have that extra side effect. And you could then turn it into things that them could, some could be institutionalized, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a part of the law. In the same way that, you know, you use the contract to create, I don't know, a, a you know, a, a, like a, a, an organized crime organization, 
But that doesn't mean that the organized crime organization is then a part of the law or following the law or anything just because you've used a contract to do it. Um, in the same way, you know, Raz talks about how um, legal systems need to be able to reach outside themselves, especially in the adjudicative process, to bring in elements from outside the legal system that are relevant to making the kinds of legal adjudications that they need to do. And sometimes that may be to give those things legal status and thereby they get to be in some sense a part of the legal system. But in another sense, those things that they're reaching outside have a pre-institutional reality um, that may that that we don't say thereby is is somehow legalized by the fact that the law is some is using them as a ground for a legal decision or something like that. Yeah. Thank you. Oh so um I will I will reply to so it seems to me that the way you um you commented on, on my piece can be divided in two parts. So the first has to do with um, whether legal positivism is consistent. So whether this could be uh, an attack against uh, a conception of legal positivism. Um, and the second is how we can accommodate uh, what I have said within the legal positivistic framework. Mm -hmm. Now, first of all, my point, and this is, I, this I think is relevant, um, starts from a very narrow, mm -hmm. and this could be a, a weak point, a very narrow conception of legal positivism, namely, the idea that the content of an institution is created by a specific kind of social facts, namely authoritative declarations. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you take a, a broader conception of social facts now, and, and so, and, and if you interpret the, the social source thesis in terms of social facts in general, nothing I have said uh, is in contrast with legal positives because even uh, meta-institutional practices can be social facts and systematic fallouts can be social facts. And, um, and, and, and in this sense, legal positivism could not be touched. However, it seems to me that this definition of legal positivism in terms of social facts in general, could be over-inclusive because it would make the same of legal positivism and legal realism, for example. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, if you include all kinds of social facts, also moral conceptions which are shared in a given social context, then those are social, but then one could say that there is a sort of natural law with a changing content here. So here, if you, if you consider legal positivism in such a broad way in terms of social facts in general, uh, it seems that your definition of legal positivism is over-inclusive. So what I'm doing is attacking this view, which is narrow, authoritative, declarative speech. Um, and you said, you said, um, that there can be necessary conditions of these speech acts that are presupposed, but that are not part of the institution. So they, they, uh, they can be a condition, even a conceptual condition, but they are not part of the, of the institution. Now, it seems to me this is difficult to, to understand. So it seems to me that, uh, for example, if you have a conception of legal validity that has some formal requirements, but that attaches to legal validity, a background ritual meaning, this cannot but be part of the institution. This is part of the conceptual content of the institution. 
This is a, 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 an example of an institution, legal institution, which has a strong connection with religious conceptual content, you see? So it seems to me that when it comes to the meta-institutional context, it, it, you cannot make this difference between the necessary conceptual presuppositions and the actual content of the institution, because these necessary conceptual presuppositions will inevitably have a strong bearing on the content of the institution, how it is conceptualized, uh, it's rational, how it is interpreted. So this will be, hmm, will, will have an impact on, on the institutional structure. What about a systematic fallout? When it comes to systematic fallouts here, indeed, one could say, as it seems to me you are doing, okay, this is something that happens after you practice the law. It is not even necessary, it is contingent, depend on the social context, some strategies, some side effects. Uh, can exist in one context and not in another. So they are not really part of the institution. Yeah, here I see your point, but perhaps here I am assuming a little bit of realism, but wouldn't you say that to give a proper explanation of what the institutional practice is in a given legal context, you would also need to take into account these fallouts, even if they are contingent. So I agree with you, perhaps they are not part of the conceptual content of the institution. Whereas in the case of the meta-institutional level, it seems to me that it has a strong impact, can have a strong impact on the conceptual content of the institution. When it comes to systematic fallouts, okay, they are not, they have no direct bearing of the conceptual content of the institution, but it seems to me that when it comes to understand what the institution is as, as a social practice, uh, a complete explanation of the institution would require also to take this into, into account. And it seems to me that this is missed by normativistic legal positive. Um, Just a very quick follow up, or I, I don't want to overpass my bound here. Yeah. Okay. So here's here's what what one thing I would say, kind of in reply, just to amend my comment to make it a little more clear, maybe. Um, although I'm, I agree that it's not exactly what I said before. The the institution. Let's think of the institution in terms of its creation and manipulation of status. It ha it, it if we agree on that. It creates and manipulates this status that has the kind of deontic powers attached to it. So to think of a system, think of the legal of the institution as a system of that kind of status. There's an interrelation between all of the status holders and the status possession, like the status, the status giving acts, the statuses themselves, and the functions that those status statuses allow to be performed. Right? That's a kind of interlocked web that the institution has created, that we've, we've created with that institution in terms of the status. All of these other elements, right, that we're thinking of, let's say the ritualistic aspect, which could, I'm not denying that could be a part of the same institution, but I'm saying it could also not be, right? And all of these systematic fallouts, those may themselves have to do with status and the normative properties that go along with that status, but there's a disconnection between those statuses and the systematic web that we're thinking of as the one that's at the institutional level. So yeah, the fallouts can create a whole nother institution with different statuses and that's what's going on there. And maybe there's a, another web that's going on from what we're looking at behind the institutional level, although that's harder because I think that there, there's a lot more, um, there's a lot less um, kind of uh, intentionality that's perhaps needed for that systematization to develop and the, and the bestowal of the status. The status there is kind of more closer to some sort of custom or, or accident or something like that. Um, 
But putting that aside, it seems like there's a there's this disconnection between the two, and that unless the system at the institutional level reaches back out and reincorporates those elements into its its kind of web of status, then those are a part of something different, even if they're still necessary results or properties or something else that's going on with respect to that institution. Clear, clear. Thank you, Ken. Yeah. Um, so let me let me say this. If you assume that uh, an institution is a, a, a matter of creating and manipulating statuses, the question is, for what? Mm -hmm. So, and this the answer to this question is the meta institutional background. So you cannot have an institutional structure with creation and manipulation of status without an idea of the rational for this thing. And um, so my what I, what I'm, I'm I'm trying to argue is that if this is the case. So if this is the case, if you need a rational for the whole thing, and this rational is the meta-institutional background, now the conceptual content of that background will have a barrier. So you cannot make this detachment that you are, if you, if, so consider the case of an institution that is detached from its meta-institutional background, then you do not know what it is. This is the point. So you. You see, th there is a wonderful example in Schwitzer. He calls this practice ex ing, ex ing. Let's say we are doing something, we are attaching statuses, but we do not know why we are doing it. Hmm? We do not know what ex ing is. Is it a game? Is it um, um, a dance? Is it a kind of art? So the meta institutional background is needed in terms of conceptual content, uh, and 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 this has to do with the meta institutional, the detachment that you mentioned between the meta institution and the institution. When it comes to systematic fallouts, I see your point more, but here too it is true that so so every time you will have an institution, if it is a real institution, it will be practiced. If it will be practiced, the rule fabric practice will have emergent strategies and rule and, and, and side effects. So taking our theory of artifacts as a starting point, you say, and I agree with you, every time you have an artifact, you will have a community of users. And this community of users will in part also have an impact on how the artifact develops. So a full explanation of this thing must be part, I, I, I would say, of our metaphysical explanation of what the whole thing is. Thank you. Um, do we have any further questions from the participants? Julieta? Well, thank you very much for your presentation. I really liked it. So I have some questions. Um, maybe one of them is related to the thing that you started discussing with, with Ken. Um, I was wondering when you explained, for example, that the background uh, assumptions like, I don't remember, I think that it was the chess. Um, no, it. I don't remember if, if it was the chess uh, example, but you said something on the likes of that there could be a background assumption in some practice as that something uh, it's um, or would count as a higher honor at some point. Yeah, the precedent. The precedent. Yeah, so sorry, because I, I was thinking while the slide was going on, so I didn't. But in this sense, if you have a background assumption saying that something is or could be or consider us counting us, wouldn't be this a rule in the sense of, maybe not a rule in the sense of what you are saying, like a declaration of officials, but then, and this connects with my second question, what you are thinking when you say rule? What is your conception of rules? So just to wrap a little more this. And the third question is connected 
to these uh, to these two questions. Um, when um, when you say that, for example, two institutions that have the same rules and the same um, collective acceptance, but different background content, uh, content can be to different institutions because of the explanation that you gave. Um, I was wondering whether the background assumptions and also the consequences in the systematic fallouts be considered as belonging to rules. Because the rules, depending on your conception of rules, if you consider rules depending on declarations or rules as some result of some uterans, these uterances have contexts. So the context can be considered to be include, included, I'm so sorry, included in the rule in itself. And if this is so, the sets of rules are not the same if they have different background assumptions. I, okay. I was wondering if that was um, considered, because I, I think that it's, if we see this like this, it's not that they have to uh, the same set of rules, but they have different set of rules from the beginning, the institutions. Because the context is different. Yeah, because I, it will depend naturally or on what do you think a rule is or your conception of rules. But if you consider rules to be or the same or the result of an issuance act or a uterans act, then the background comes within the rule in itself. So in this sense, it would not be that the sets are the same, but the background assumptions are different. The sets are different from the beginning. Yeah, so yeah. thank you very much. No, thank you. Thank you. And by the way, it's, it's great to see you again. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for, for participating. Um, so the background, couldn't that be also back? Couldn't we uh, account for background considerations in terms of rules. Uh, yeah, I think we can. So, in in for example, marmor makes a distinction between surface and deep conventions, but both of them can be conventions. Hmm? Uh, so, um, I, I do not necessarily share marmor's conventionalist view, but I think that indeed even the rules of what Schwitzer calls grammar are rules can be seen as rules, can be seen as a reconstruction of assumptions in terms of rules. And in this way, they can have a bearing on the content of uh, declarative speech acts. Of course, they can, because if you have the idea, for example, that when I have, when I, I, I pass a statute, um in, in 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 my sincerity condition to use sir's idea um there is the the conceptual content that this counts also as a honorific ritual thing this this has a bearing definitely my point is that these things you cannot change by declaration and given that you cannot change these things by declaration there are elements of the content of an institution and what an institution is that are not changed by declaration, but rather are presupposed by declarative speech acts. By the way, I, I, I'm not sure whether uh, a positivist could agree. No, I'm not sure the extent to which a positivist could, could share this because in a sense, you lose control over the content, over the criteria of identity of an institution if you give this for granted. So it, I, I, I recall Kelsen's preoccupation about this. Hmm? So he, he, he wanted law to be pure and exactly for this reason, these background assumptions could not be part of uh, um, um, a real scientific reconstruction of the law and of the law is, huh? because indeed you can have several elements that are outside um, declarative will. 
Okay, so this is this is my point. It seems to me that this is sufficient to to create an argument against this kind of of uh, positivistic view. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, if there are no further questions, perhaps I could just um, pose a, a brief and simple question as uh, some sort of follow up on this discussion. Um, I would like to hear, for example, uh, of course, also you can do it briefly. Uh, to which extent do you think that your suggestions and insights actually undermine for example, Hart's theory, and to which extent do you think uh, his approach to law and legal theory in general in the methodological sense is of use to us? And what would be the, the implications or the consequences uh, of your suggestions when it comes to that methodological aspect? Okay, so I think that In a sense, it complements Hart's theory. What I, I've tried to do was to, uh, in, in previous writings, was to elaborate on Hart's distinction between the internal and external point of view to account for this. So, for example, it seems to me that there is a distinction between, between someone who has the internal point of view only because he or she accepts the rules, let's say from an alienated perspective. So I accept the rules and I apply them. That's it. And the internal point of view of someone who instead uh, embraces and accepts the overall meta-institutional rational of the, of, the, of the legal institution, and so he or she is accepting the rules, not simply because they are the rules, but because they have an inherent rationale and so on and so on. So I, 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 I formulated the distinction uh, as a distinction between the alienated participant and the committed participant. The, um, it seems to me that this is perhaps useful to further elaborate on Hart's uh, theory of the internal point of view. And by the way, you can use para-institutional level to elaborate on the external point of view, because you can have also positions of people who are the bad men in, in all senses, so they have they adopt an external, moderate external point of view, moderate or, or extreme, but depending on the kind of para-institutional effect they are using, they can have different positions. So, Three-dimensional model, in my view, also makes it possible to elaborate a further uh, distinction between kinds of points of view over the law, in our sense. Consequences for legal theory, consequences for law. Yeah, I would say that the first consequence is, and I, I, I don't know whether this is a consequence that positive lawyers would accept is that um, you cannot be a real lawyer without also having an idea of para-institutional phenomena and meta-institutional phenomena. So the idea is that um, these social considerations are necessary. So a possible consequence would be to introduce um, more interdisciplinary courses in legal uh, courses, so avoiding a purely formalistic uh, perspective, because the idea is that legal institutions are not simply sets of rules. Mm -hmm. This could be a consequence. More interdisciplinary work. Okay, understood. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. If there are no further virtual hands, I guess we can officially close. Thank you again, uh, Professor, for holding a wonderful lecture and the participants for uh, a great discussion. 
Um, I will use this opportunity just to briefly announce that we have uh, in the, during the next week a uh, busy, busy week called uh, Belgrade Legal Philosophy Week within the ALF project uh, organized by the Center for Legal Fundamentals. It's going to be on the topic of AI and law, and within that, we're going to have three Belgrade Legal Theory Group meetings. You'll, of course, receive the, the promo materials and uh, the necessary information via email and the social network. But uh, just as uh, a preview, it's going to be from the University of Genoa, Marco Segatti. Then from the University of Lisbon, we're going to have Domingos Farinho. And then uh, from the University of Genoa again, um, Elena Ferrari, Allegra Grillo, and Alessio Sardo, if I have pronounced the names right. Uh, so keep uh, watching and uh, uh, following us on the networks, and I hope to see you all again very soon. Definitely. And I thank you all. Thank you very much for uh, participating and discussing. It was our pleasure. See you, Corrado. Take care. Bye, Ken. Bye, bye, Julia. Bye. Bye, bye, bye. Corrado. Thank you very much. Bye, bye, Professor.